Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Xander's Facts. Hello, everyone. Welcome into the latest edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander, and thank you for listening here on episode 79 of the podcast here on Wednesday, October 19th. 2022 thank you all for listening we have got a big podcast this week so big we are going all around the world this week we are focusing on two big events happening in two foreign countries we're not talking about the u.s this week we are talking about ukraine and brazil brazil's got a presidential election that's going on right now which is very interesting so we're going to talk about that and of course you know what's going on in ukraine the russian invasion that's going on there so I brought in our Zaner's Facts, Ukraine, Russia, Eastern European, all that. The expert that we have on this region, Dr. Bobby, he will be joining me on this podcast. So stay tuned. We are going all around the world this week to discuss some interesting and important topics. So we're going to get to that in just a second. But I thought I would remind you before we get started here on the Zaner's Facts podcast, if you think you're going to like the facts, On this week's edition, or if you've liked all the previous facts on the previous 78 episodes, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 79, rate and review the podcast, then go on all your socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Xander's Facts, that is Xander with a Z. And by the way, before I get to the thing that you know I'm going to say... What do you say? Let me just remind you that I am still making my weekly football picks on college and pro games all season long. Those are on exclusively Xander's Facts on Instagram and Xander's Facts Sporting Club, which is a separate Instagram channel now, which you should go check out because I have been doing, uh, well, last week wasn't that great of a week, but usually I've been doing pretty well this year. Also, with the big game that happened this past weekend in college football, Alabama, Tennessee, Good all Rocky Top, because you know who picked that game correctly was Xander. Xander's Facts? So I'm just letting you know. But those are where the facts are on Sater's Facts Instagram and also Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. Check all those out. It's at Sater's Facts, Xander with a Z. But most importantly, remember to tell all your friends. Friend Facts! Sater's Facts podcast. Tell everyone you know about the podcast, about Sater's Weekend Facts, which is, if you didn't know, a newsletter recapping the week's top facts and headlines every Sunday morning. It's free. You can get it in your email inbox. The link is in this episode's description. Check it out. The Xander's Facts link tree has all the Xander's Facts links that you need, including the Xander's Weekend Facts and the Xander's Facts YouTube channel, because this episode is going to be on YouTube. Check that out. And of course, the thing that I have been hyping for several weeks now, Xander'sFacts.com, which is not ready yet. But I will just warn you all, You might want to listen next week for a little bit of announcement. Ah, didn't say anything. I don't know. You just might want to listen to next week's podcast. I'm just saying. SatersFacts.com, next week's podcast, SatersFacts merch. Uh, Listen to next week's podcast. No one cares. Oh, it's going to be a good one. So, that's next week, though. This week is episode 79 of the podcast. And as I mentioned earlier, we are going around the world. Brazil and Ukraine. We've talked a lot, or a little bit at least, about the midterm elections, which are coming up. November 8th is election day in this country, but Brazil is also having some elections. It's election season in the US and in Brazil. So I thought we'd talk about the Brazilian elections because those might be a little more important than you think. And we're also going to talk with Dr. Bobby about Ukraine. We haven't had him on since the spring, May, I believe. A lot has happened. A lot has happened recently. So we talked about that to get everyone updated on Ukraine with Dr. Bobby. So those are the two things that we are talking about this week on episode 79 of the podcast. We are not talking about the U.S. We'll get back to the U.S. next week. But this week, we are taking a trip around the world and we are going to start. We're going to go south to South America. We are going to start in Brazil. Where, as I said, it's not just election season in the U.S., but in Brazil as well. We are less than one month away from Election Day in the U.S., and people are already voting. You might have already voted. And by the way, 
I know I complained a couple weeks ago that I didn't get my absentee ballot yet, but I got it in the mail, and I voted. So Xander's Facts is a voter this year, just to let you know. I stand by what I preach on this podcast, which are facts, in the voting booth. These are facts. Or in the mail. How about that? But you should go vote if you haven't already. A lot of people are already voting in the U.S., and by the way, another by the way, you should check out our early one-month-out preview of the midterms, which was two podcasts ago, episode 77. Check that out also. But it's less than one month away from Election Day in the States, but it is even closer to Election Day in Brazil. The Brazilian presidential election is currently ongoing, and it is definitely worth your attention. So you may remember, previously on this podcast, we broke down the German elections, which happened last fall. Olaf Scholz became chancellor of Germany. And in the spring, we broke down the French elections, where Emmanuel Macron was re-elected as president. Now, we are not going to Europe for an election. We are going down to South America, where democracy may be on the line in this election. Tell me where you have heard that before. In this country, but also in Brazil. That is a very real threat, which I will get into in a second. So let's break down how Brazilian elections work, who the candidates are on the ballot this year, and why this election matters to you if you don't live in Brazil. Because I wouldn't be talking about this if it didn't matter to you if you didn't live in Brazil, because it does. What? So first off, how do elections in Brazil work? Well, first off, let me just say as a disclaimer, that I, very recently, as in the day I'm recording this podcast, wrote a research paper on the government systems in Brazil. So I am very well versed at the moment of how the government and elections work in Brazil. I didn't ask that. And I can tell you that the structure of the government that Brazil has is actually very similar to that of the United States. Now, there are definitely some distinctions. But overall, when taking a look at a lot of other democracies, Brazil and the United States in their democratic structures are very close together. Like, Brazil also has three separate branches of their federal government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. So you've got the court system and the judicial, you've got the president and the executive, and in the legislative, You've got a bicameral legislature, which means in your legislature, you have two houses. Like in the U.S., we have the House of Representatives and the Senate. In Brazil, they have the National Congress, which is their legislature, which is composed of the Chamber of Deputies and the Federal Senate. So actually, back on October 2nd of this month, Brazil held elections for president, the National Congress, and governors and legislatures for all 26 states. So there are 26 states in Brazil and the federal district, which contains the capital Brasilia, which is basically Washington, D.C., but they actually get voting members in Congress, unlike Washington, D.C., which does not. So all the states also have governors and unicameral legislatures, so they only have one house in their legislature, and also judicial systems. So it's kind of like the U.S. America. So October 2nd is when elections were held for president, the National Congress, and for state elections. So the National Congress elections had all the seats in the Chamber of Deputies up. So the Chamber of Deputies is the lower house. That is comparable to the House of Representatives. That has 513 seats. All of those were on the ballot. And in the federal Senate, 27 of the 81 seats were up for grabs. And the federal Senate is comparable to the U.S. Senate, the upper house of the legislature. And the thing that is different with the Chamber of Deputies and the House of Representatives, in the House of Representatives, we have states, and then we split the states up into districts based on population. Each state gets a different number of representatives. We make districts, and from those districts, one candidate wins. In Brazil, they don't have congressional districts inside of their states. 
they use proportional representation to figure out how many representatives represent a state, and then they all run in the entirety of that state. So, for example, Sao Paulo, which is the largest city in Brazil and the largest state in Brazil, has 70 seats in the Chamber of Deputies. So those 70 seats are not 70 separate districts. That's for the entire state, if that makes sense. And then the Senate's very similar because each state gets three senators. Doesn't matter the population. Kind of like the U.S., every state gets two senators for the Senate. And the federal district gets three senators, too. And Washington, D.C. gets zero. So there's that. But unlike the U.S., Brazil has a lot more political parties that are present in their legislature. We have a total of two in the United States. Brazil has a total of 23 parties who won seats in the Chamber of Deputies alone. Nine parties have seats in the federal Senate. So 23 different parties. That is unfathomable in the U.S. But there are also a bunch of parties in France. And Germany. So it's not uncommon in a lot of other countries, but in the US, it has. And we could argue about how that's probably not a good thing, which I don't know. We should probably talk about that in a future episode on this podcast. But anyway, quit whining. Because there are so many parties, coalitions are definitely necessary, like we saw in the German elections last year. So that's basically the legislature elections, which already happened for the National Congress. Now, as I said, we also had the presidential election, which happens every four years. And like in the French presidential election that we covered back in the spring, there were many candidates on the ballot, unlike what we have here in the U.S. We have the top two candidates, and then you have the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, or whatever, and then you can write somebody in. They have a ton of different names on the ballot for president. Now, this is the first round. Because like in France, if no candidate receives 50% of the nationwide vote, the top two candidates would advance to a runoff. Now, I said back in the spring in France, it has never happened that a presidential candidate has gotten over 50% in the first round. Now, Brazil has only had the system in place since 1989, but there have been instances, actually a couple, where there has been a single candidate That won over 50% of the vote in the first round, so there didn't need to be a second round. But last time in 2018, there did need to be a runoff. So this time in 2022, just like 2018, no candidate ended up getting 50% of the vote. So we are now heading for a runoff, which is going to happen on Sunday, October 30th. So in about a week and a half, the top two candidates. Just like in France, the top two candidates in the first round advanced to the runoff. Those are former President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva and incumbent President Jair Bolsonaro. We all know about Bolsonaro. So the first one, the former president who goes by Lula, that's his nickname, and he actually got his nickname into his legal name. So there you go. He got the most votes. He got 48.43% of the first round vote, 57,259,504 votes. While Bolsonaro, the incumbent president, got 43.20% of the vote, 51,072,345 votes. And the third place candidate got nowhere close, 4.16% of the vote. That's a lot of numbers. So these were going to be the top two candidates. The question was, there were polls that had shown Lula getting over 50% of the vote, which would have given him the first round win. So that was on the table. That did not happen. So we are going for a runoff. And by the way, I will note that Brazil has a population of about 100 million less people than the United States, but their voting numbers are pretty high because in Brazil, Voting for individuals who are between the ages of 18 and 70 and who are literate is mandatory. Like, not in the U.S., it's a right. You must do it or you pay a fine. 
in Brazil. Get that dough! So that is also a distinction from the United States. But the two candidates are Lula and Bolsonaro. So, who are these two candidates? Because I might have mentioned Bolsonaro on this podcast before, but you all probably don't know all about him. So, let's take a look at these two candidates, and let's start off with the incumbent, Jair Bolsonaro, who was elected president back in 2018 with 55% of the vote in the runoff election, as I said. He is a member of the Liberal Party, which, shocker, I know, is not exactly liberal. It's actually a right-wing conservative party, which he joined last year. He ran in 2018 as a member of the Social Liberal Party, which, by the way, is also not liberal. I don't know why they have these names. These parties are not liberal. Whoops. They are conservative. That'd be very confusing. So he ran with that party in 2018 and then left that party the next year and joined the Liberal Party in 2021. So Bolsonaro is a retired military officer who served as a federal deputy in the Chamber of Deputies who represented the state of Rio de Janeiro, if you've ever heard of it, from 1991 to 2018. He was in the Congress in the Chamber of Deputies. Now, Bolsonaro has not exactly been terribly popular during his tenure, at least according to opinion polls with the Brazilian people. He's been described as far-right, nationalist, populist, which are pretty accurate. Bolsonaro has voiced his oppositions to abortion, immigration, same-sex marriage, affirmative action, the separation of church and state, secularism, drug liberalization, and environmental regulations. That last one. He said at one point that global warming is nothing more than, quote, greenhouse fables, unquote, and the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest has reached a record high under his administration, which is not just a bad thing for Brazil, but the entire world, because the Amazon is a massive rainforest, a massive ecosystem, and because of the deforestation, you're cutting down the rainforest, which has its own things, and it's also causing an increase in wildfires, which is also, most of the time, not good. And so he has been a very big proponent on industry in the Amazon rainforest region, which has caused deforestation. We don't want deforestation. We want reforestation. That's cool. Also, he has expressed support for the death penalty, which the death penalty is legal in a bunch of states in the United States. But in Brazil, it has been banned since the new democratic regime came about in 1988 and has been an adamant supporter of, we all know, former president of these United States, Donny Boy. And to top it all off, Jair Bolsonaro has questioned the outcome of the 2020 presidential election in the United States. So there's all that stuff, but it has also been Bolsonaro's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been a massive blunder. Brazil has some of the largest per capita death rates due to COVID in the world. Bolsonaro was quick to claim in the first time periods of the pandemic, that COVID was no deadlier than the flu, and then tested positive for the virus days after intentionally coming in close contact with media members because he wanted to reiterate that COVID was not that big of a deal, and has also called the virus a fantasy created by the media. And YouTube has had to remove videos that were posted by Bolsonaro on YouTube that contained false information regarding COVID. He has criticized wearing masks and taking the vaccine. The vaccine rollout in Brazil was also a jumbled mess because Bolsonaro's government, Bolsonaro didn't believe in taking the vaccine. At least he didn't tell you publicly. Like Donnie Boy doesn't talk about it, but he got it. So there's that. Bolsonaro was also, how about this? He was recognized as the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project's Person of the Year in 2020. So he actually got an award. How about that? But I went on 
and read deeper about this award. Uh oh. And it recognizes the individual who has done the most in the world to advance organized criminal activity and corruption. So the that is probably one of the awards that you do not want to win. Corruption and high murder rates, they have long been a problem in Brazil for decades and decades. But they have definitely not improved under Bolsonaro's administration. And he has long been known since he, his candidacy, and he's been elected, as the Trump of the tropics. Oh, yay. So there you go with Jair Bolsonaro, the current president of Brazil. So now let's go to his opponent, his challenger, who, as I said, is Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who goes by Lula, who served as the president of Brazil from 2003 to 2010. Now, you might be thinking, that's two terms already. But in Brazil, there are no limits to presidential terms, except you cannot serve more than two terms consecutively. So he couldn't run again in 2010, but he can serve a third term because this term will not be consecutive. So it is fine for him to run. Now, Lula is a founding member of the left-wing Workers' Party, which began back in 1980. These candidates aren't exactly spring chickens, by the way. Lula is 76 years old, and Bolsonaro is 67 years old. So they're dealing with what we're doing here in the U.S. We are uh, putting out the old candidates out there. But anyway, Lula, before he was president, spent much of his early adult life advocating on behalf of unions and the labor movement and won a congressional election in 1986 in the Chamber of Deputies. And he ran for president in 1989, 1994, and 1998, lost all three times, finally won in 2002, and became president of Brazil. And he served two terms from 2003 when he was inaugurated to 2010. So during his two terms as president, his administration focused on social programs. That's what they've been most known for. The Zero Hunger Program, which distributed cash to the poor for food, and most notably is Bolsa Familia, which provided financial aid to families whose children attended school and were vaccinated. And the programs, most notably the latter that I mentioned, along with job market improvements and a raise in the minimum wage, those programs have been hailed as a major cause of the poverty rate in Brazil, dropping 27.7% in Lula's first term, which is crazy it was that high, but it dropped 27%, 28% almost, in his first term. That program was replaced last year by a new and supposedly more generous program introduced by the Bolsonaro administration, although there have been many critics of it. The Economist noted that it added complexity and uncertainty, and a lot of critics noted that Bolsonaro was just implementing this to try and gain votes for the election, which he may have. But if it gives more Brazilians more benefits to get out of poverty, because poverty is still a major problem in Brazil, then that would work. It's not. We don't know if it will, but we'll see. And also, Lula's creation of conservation areas and indigenous reserves during his administration was a key factor in limiting deforestation during his administration. So two polar opposites right there on the environment. And the economy also grew during his term, becoming the eighth largest in the world. And that was despite the major economic crisis that happened worldwide in 2008 happening during his second term. However, however, like many other past presidents in Brazil, including Bolsonaro, Lula has been involved in a couple of scandals. The most notable one, which you've probably heard of if you keep track of Brazilian politics, you might know as Operation Car Wash, where Lula was accused of lobbying for government contacts in foreign countries from 2011 to 2014, with police alleging that Lula had collaborated in illegal bribes from Petrobras which is a state-owned oil company, to benefit his political party and presidential campaign. He also plans to run for president in 2018 as well. However, he was found guilty of those charges with a sentencing 
of nine and a half years in prison. However, all the convictions that were against Lula last year were annulled. That was because it was found that the judge he was sentenced by was biased against Lula, and there was evidence that was revealed by The Intercept that found that the judge and the lead prosecutor for Operation Car Wash actually conspired to prevent Lula from running for president in 2018. And that judge then joined the Bolsonaro administration when he became president. So, yeah. I mean, imagine something like that happening in the U.S. That would be crazy. But also, Brazil's a very young democracy. Stuff like that happens. As I mentioned, major corruption in that country. So, Lula is free to run in 2020 after being cleared of the charges. So, that's an overview of the two candidates in the running. Those are the two candidates who are going to be on the ballot in a week and a half. So, you might be asking, why is this election so important to me? Good question. I will tell you, because I think it is. Brazil, as I said, is obviously an emerging democracy in South America. South America, of course, has not been known for its prosperous democracies. It's only had free elections consecutively since 1989, Brazil has, and before that, from 1945 to 1960, there was a military coup. There were two military coups before 1945, one in 1930 and one in 1945, and another in 1964, which resulted in a military dictatorship, basically, which ended with the election in 1989. This is true. So they did have free democratic elections before, but now consecutively, they have had free democratic elections for about three decades, a little more than three decades. But its democracy, I would say, is definitely at stake in this election. Because one thing I didn't mention about Bolsonaro is that he has spent much of his term casting doubt on the electoral systems of Brazil and has insisted, he has insisted that he will win. Like, I'm not just talking about, we will win regular political candidate stuff. I'm talking about stuff that goes deeper than that. He insisted that he would win outright in the first round, and of course he got even less votes than his major competitor. He's also claimed that the electronic voting machines of the country are easily susceptible to tampering, which you might have heard before because another president, who is now a former president, Donnie Boy, in this country, in the United States, also claimed that. And just like Donnie Boy, his claims have been proven to be false, Brazil has used electronic voting machines since 1996, and there has not been any significant fraud that has been registered with those. That was dumb. Now, Lula is expected to win. He has led by a significant margin in the majority of the polls. The polls have actually gotten closer in recent weeks. The Economist model projects right now that Lula is going to win with 52% of the vote. Bolsonaro will get 48%, but in the first round, we already had the first round of voting, as I said. Bolsonaro and his allies outperformed expectations, definitely in the National Congress, but they also made sure that a runoff happened, because it was definitely a possibility that Lula could have gotten over 50% in the first round and won. That did not happen, he only got 48%. So, it is possible that polls are undercounting support for Bolsonaro and the right wing in Brazil, kind of like what's happened with some polls in the U.S. Now, in the U.S., the polls for the president were basically on target because that was obviously doing the national vote. But local polls have been pretty off in some instances here in the United States. That could be what's happening in Brazil. It kind of happened in the first round. We'll see if it happens in the second round. But right now, Lula is the favorite to win this election. However, even if he wins, Bolsonaro is still likely to claim that he won. Remind you of anyone else? That could prove to have, though, much dire consequences than it did in the U.S. Brazil's democratic institutions are much younger and inexperienced than those that we have in the U.S. And you see how close it got in the U.S. when Donnie Boy told all his rally-goers in D.C. on January 6th, we're going to walk to the Capitol. And by the way, 
the last January 6th committee hearing before the midterms happened last week, and I reviewed that on Xander's Weekend Facts, which you should go check out. Same as Bog. By the way. But anyway, it could prove to have much bigger consequences if Bolsonaro continues to claim that he won if he didn't. If he's able to galvanize the military, as I said, he's a former military officer. He has been trying to gain support of the military the past four years because he knew he was going to have to try and do this. If he's able to put the military behind him and they do whatever he wants, that is going to have a devastating effect for democracy in Brazil. And not just Brazil. South America, and not even just for democracy, but other issues, like most notably the environment, because it's safe to say if Bolsonaro gets reelected, or if he stays in power, even if he didn't win the majority of the votes, by the way, I told you I did the research paper, 1930, a presidential candidate lost and a military coup happened to put him in power for the next 15 years. So that is not unprecedented. It's the truth. If Bolsonaro stays in power, it's likely that Amazon deforestation is going to continue at rapid rates. And I'm not talking about Amazon the company, I'm talking about the rainforest Amazon. That could have damaging effects, not just in Brazil, not just in South America, but across the globe. And it's probably going to hurt climate change, which Bolsonaro doesn't believe in, so he doesn't care. But probably the results of this election, however it goes, are less likely to have an effect globally than those in Germany and France. Obviously, those countries are very important. Brazil is important, not as so as those countries, but it is definitely important on the world stage. But they're definitely going to send a message no matter the result. If Bolsonaro actually wins, that's not going to prove well for democracy in any case. If Lula is able to take power and win with the majority of the vote, that could prove encouraging for democracy. So, you know, take that as you will. Will it be Lula or will it be Bolsonaro? That question will be answered Sunday, October 30th, when we find out the results of the election when they come in, which is expected to be in the evening hours of that Sunday night. Sunday, October 30th, is when Brazilians will vote in the second round of the presidential election. So how about that? The elections in Brazil, everything you need to know, now you know about them, and now you know why they are definitely important and why you should be keeping an eye on them for the next week and a half. So those finish up later this month, and obviously election day is November 8th, in the United States. So remember to make a plan to vote if you haven't already done so. Go check out our one month to go to the midterms preview. That was a couple weeks ago on the podcast. And in two weeks, we are going to have our ultimate midterm elections preview on this podcast the week before the midterms. That is going to be exciting. Do not miss it and don't miss next week's podcast either. So that is our trip down to South America. Bye-bye. But we are not done on our trip across the globe on this podcast. Now we are going back to Europe, to Ukraine. Because the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that war is still going on. It is still very important what is going on. It's gotten less media coverage, as expected, obviously, since the beginnings, first few months of the war here in the U.S. But there's been actually been a lot of important events that have happened in the last few weeks and months going on there. So I brought in our Xander's Facts specialist on this issue, Dr. Bobby, to talk about this and update us all on the facts of what is going on in Ukraine. So let's get to it. Dr. Bobby is back on the podcast talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine on episode 79 as the Xander's Facts podcast continues. Xander's Facts. Welcome back to the Xander's Facts podcast, episode 79. We are continuing our trip around the world. We are heading to Eastern Europe now, not the best place to be right now, which is why we have Dr. Bobby, who is back on the podcast, 
once again. He is the director of the Russian program at Virginia Tech to talk about what is going on in Ukraine. Dr. Bobby, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Xander. And congratulations on your 79th episode. Oh, I think I'm about 10 episodes too late, unfortunately. Nice! All righty then. So we are talking about Ukraine this week because you haven't been on, I believe, since May or so. Russia invaded Ukraine in February and a lot has happened and a lot of the coverage here in the U.S. has kind of died down. But that doesn't mean that there's still a lot of stuff going on in Ukraine. So we're going to talk about it here on the podcast to get you all up to date. So I've got a couple questions here for Dr. Bobby. And let's just start. As I said, we are about eight months now into this invasion that Russia has done in Ukraine. That happened back in February. At the time, I remember we had you on the podcast. At the time, we thought that Russia would probably have a pretty easy time going into Kiev and taking control of the country, at least somewhat. That has not happened. It's not even close to what has actually happened. Since Russian forces' initial surge into Ukraine, we have had major advancements by Ukrainian forces. They've basically, Russia basically now occupies eastern territories in Ukraine and some southeast territories, and that's basically it right now. So what have been your biggest takeaways on the failure of Russia to take control in Ukraine as they have wanted to do and we thought was going to happen? Well, obviously, the greatest revelation that this war has brought about has been the the, the really catastrophic we- weakness of the Russian military. It's something that manifests itself on almost every single level, going going right up to the top to the very bottom. This is obviously the uh, the biggest takeaway. Now, there have been there have been major problems with corruption, ineptitude forever dating well back into the Soviet days. This is this is nothing new, but I think the degree to which this has sort of metastasized throughout the entire military system, the military industrial complex, such as it is in Russia, was very much a surprise to everybody. And it looks to that they're just sort of resorting to, to old tactics. They've basically decided that really all they can do is function as a kind of state terrorist organization. And Putin's strategy right now almost seems to be to throw bodies at the problem. So that's kind of a basic overview of what's been going on, basically. But there's actually been a lot of stuff that has happened recently, which is really important, which I want to get into. So we can start with the fact that last month, Russia held annexation referendums in the four territories of Ukraine that they occupy, which, as I said, are in eastern Ukraine. They've been bombing all over the country, including Kiev recently, but the territories they control are only in eastern Ukraine right now, basically on the Russian border. But most of the world, including the U.S., much of Europe, have called the referendums a sham. The only country that has actually accepted the validity of the results is North Korea, which you know, <laughs> not, not the best group to be a part of. And the UN has condemned them as a violation of the United Nations Charter. So, why did Vladimir Putin go ahead with these referendums in these Ukrainian territories if the rest of the world is going to say those are a sham, they don't matter? A couple of things here. What, what you just said uh, in, the, in the previous question, you know, the takeaways from Russia's failure to take control of Ukraine, Russia ostensibly controlled parts of these regions before. Uh, not entirely, but they really do not control them now. The The territories that they have, have annexed are, are not under complete Russian control. Even the previous annexation of Crimea, and incidentally, this is the reason that Putin went ahead with the, uh, the referendums. The, even, even Crimea right now is is in a very precarious state, you know, like we saw with the uh, the bombing on the Kerch Bridge. Even even places that are part of Russia, at least in name, as far as the Russian government is is concerned, are not under Russian control, not entirely. There is a pretty extensive Ukrainian partisan network that is that is operating in all of these territories. And with the assassination of Dugina, you know, several weeks ago, they're operating in greater Russia too, you know, to more, well, really more or less effectively. 
as well. But you know, back to the uh, the heart of that question. So, so why did Putin go ahead with the referendums? It was essentially to, I think, drum up support domestically, at least in the way that the annexation of Crimea sort of got the jingoism going back in 2014. Now, this is not to say that this was not also an occasion for nuclear saber rattle. But I don't think that Putin was really under any kind of illusions that once they did these sham referendums, which were universally recognized as such, that suddenly the rest of the world would say, OK, this is Russia. We we recognize this as, you know, as real Russian territory. He knew nobody was going to do that. I think that the, boy, I almost said implicit, explicit threat of nuclear weapons that is is attached to this is probably more for the domestic audience too. You know, obviously the nuclear threats that they've been making really since the very beginning of the conflict have not gone away, but trying to extend this to what are really just the occupied territories right now doesn't seem to be having any kind of effect on Western or really world attitudes towards the conflict. It's, it certainly has not staunched the flow of weapons and aid to Ukraine. And you have got to think that the Kremlin knew that is what's going to happen. Although this actually becomes one of the biggest mysteries of the, uh, of the entire conflict is what do they really know? And what are they really thinking? Because a lot of the moves that they're making are so counterintuitive that they 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 seem almost senseless, as if the people making the decisions do not have any real trustworthy information as far as what's going on on the ground. So you brought up a lot of things there, which we're going to get to, including the risk of a nuclear weapon being used, which Putin has talked about. We're going to get into, but also. You mentioned the blowing up explosion of the only bridge that links the Crimean Peninsula, which Russia has occupied since 2014, to Russia. Last week, or a few days ago, there was a huge explosion on that bridge, and now you can't get across. So, you know, that's the only way for Russia to get to the Crimean Peninsula without going through their other occupied territories. That are in Ukraine. So, how much of a blow is that for Russian forces fighting in southern Ukraine? Actually, you can you you can get across. I mean, it is it is functional again. The I mean, the explosion was devastating, but it did not it did not destroy the bridge. They are still using it. It's it still is part of their their military supply network to Crimea. I think as much as anything else, when this first happened, yeah, it definitely did disrupt the flow of supplies. But when it first happened, it was kind of unclear whether this was really going to be a successful strategic move or really something that was more of a symbolic victory for, for Ukraine. It turns out, I mean, to a limited extent, it was both. Strategically speaking, though, it's not, you know, it, it was not really a coup de grace or anything like that. Symbolically, though, as, as I think they've been like touting on the news, you know, quite a bit too. This was a huge deal. It's it's a very big deal to Russians who are living in Crimea. You know, the idea that you can be cut off from the mainland like this, especially in a in the face of an army that is continually making advances, very much so down here in the south as well. You know, I think the unease that this creates both in the in the population that is most at risk there as well as in the Kremlin and certainly among you know members of the Russian military or of, uh, among other members of the uh, the Russian political structure it's huge it it really is a big deal it's not something that we've you know, we we certainly noticed it over here in the West, but like so many things that have been happening in Ukraine, it just seems to be one of those things like, hey, it happens. This is a big deal. We're very much covering it, but now we're moving on. They certainly have not forgotten about it over there. So in Ukraine, they're basically taking that as a symbol of our army advancing against Russia? I think it's a little bit more than that. It's 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 certainly not just the you know the army advancing. I mean you know make make no mistake the the Ukrainian army is is 
is nowhere near the uh, the bridge con connecting the uh, Crimea to the uh, you know, the mainland Russia, as it were. But to a Ukrainian, particularly one who is fighting for the existence of their country, this bridge possesses immense symbolic value. You know, I mean, this this was kind of a symbol of what they would you know consider great Russian arrogance and the Russian takeover of land that was Ukrainian up to 2014. All right, so. The other thing you mentioned earlier were nuclear weapons. Putin has repeatedly left them on the table in Ukraine. He's talked about them basically this entire time, or at least mentioned them. Nothing's happened, of course, but President Biden here in the U.S. earlier this month did say that the world was at risk of nuclear Armageddon. He walked back those comments, or at least got the biggest risk of nuclear Armageddon since the Cuban Missile Crisis. He wa he's walked back those comments and said, he doesn't think that Putin's going to use nuclear weapons. But in your estimation, is there an actual threat that Putin, you know, we're not talking about a big ICBM per chance, but in your estimation, is there any actual threat that Putin would use any kind of nuclear weapon in Ukraine? If you're phrasing it that way, saying any kind of nuclear weapon, I'd say there is actually a very good chance. Now, if you're going to sort of narrow this down and say, is he going to use a strategic nuclear weapon? No. Is he going to use a tactical nuclear weapon? I, I'd say that, too, is at a very low order of probability. However, the there is still this major issue with the, uh, the Zaporizhia nu nuclear power plant, which has been a problem that has been coming up again and again and again. Uh, over the course of this conflict. At the moment, things seem to have cooled down a little bit, but but this is just, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of in a bit of a grace period with this. Far more likely than any kind of nuclear weapon going off is going to be some kind of damage to this um, to this nuclear reactor. And this indeed could be just as catastrophic. I mean, for, you know, for the Russian government too, this is, this would not necessarily be a good thing, but they've obviously had no problem throwing caution to the wind. You know, I mean, could it be as bad as Chernobyl? Probably not. But, you know, to a, it, it would certainly destroy a large chunk of Ukrainian land, which of course is Russian land at the moment. So I think this really is is probably the greatest risk. So where is that nuclear power plant? This is it's 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 in Zaporizhia. It is this is in southeastern Ukraine. It is it is definitely not too far from the front lines. I mean it, it's it's close enough that uh, that the place is very much at risk. And it's still being operated by exhausted Ukrainian troops. There have been problems going back and forth with this for for months now, and it doesn't seem to be completely resolved. It's going to be a problem that's going to come up again. But as I was saying, you know, second to this, I think, is this issue of of a tactic of a tactical nuclear weapon, which is problematic, really, for dozens of reasons. The first of which is obvious: it's a nuclear weapon. You know, this would be the first nuclear weapon exploded in anger since 1945. The only? Yeah, yeah. Really, since, since the end of World War II. It's kind of unclear a scenario where this would take place to give Russia a real advantage on the battlefield. The way the Ukrainian military is structured on the front lines, there doesn't really seem to be many, if any, spots where a tactical nuclear weapon would actually be effective. And certainly given the stunning disarray of Russian forces on the front line, they would be ill-equipped to take any kind of advantage of a nuclear explosion. So that that really just doesn't seem too terribly likely. Could you hit a city with it? Yeah, probably. But again, this would be one of those scenarios where the little support that Russia enjoys across, well, in small pockets of the world, I guess, would would almost certainly disappear. It would almost certainly ramp up Western support for Ukraine to a point where the war ends rather quickly um, and not in Russia's favor. Would we, would we see American troops on the ground in Ukraine? Probably not. But you would probably see F-16s piloted by either Ukrainians or, or Americans, probably the Ukrainians. 
Certainly, the idea that was floated earlier in the war, especially by Zelensky, but which turned out to be really not that necessary, given the uh, the, the repeated incompetence of establishing a no-fly zone, you probably would get that. And certainly, missile defense systems would, you know, to the extent possible, flood the country. It's unlikely that really using a tactical nuclear weapon to obtain some kind of tactical advantage would be would be in anybody's interest. It's just it's it's really difficult to say whether or not they would do that. Now doing this as a demonstration, doing it in the skies over central Ukraine, doing it over the Black Sea is probably much more likely. And the reasons you know, for its likelihood, and I'm not saying it's likely, likely going to happen, I would definitely put it under a 50% chance, are largely those that escape us in the West, I think. NATO, for instance, essentially the entire Western world and Eastern Europe, we're under no illusions that Russia has nuclear weapons, and that if they really did feel feel threatened by some kind of invasion, would most likely use them. Uh, they they don't really need to demonstrate them for us. I mean, there's been enough nuclear saber rattling for that. However, if you look at it from the Russian point of view, there are several ways in way in which it actually does make more sense. One of the ways it doesn't, of course, is that it would again probably just further galvanize Ukrainians to fight Russia, and it would be much more convincing that is this is a fight for survival. I, I'm not sure how much more convincing they need, but this would certainly do it. However, Russia does not just border Europe. And the countries of the former Soviet Union, particularly right now, are an absolute mess. And this is a region where Russia feels like it has to establish hegemony uh, for its own survival. You know, you have ongoing conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan, two former Soviet republics. Less than a year ago in Kazakhstan, you had you had a revolt. Georgia has been, at least from the Kremlin's point of view, a massive thorn in the side. Right now, Russia is not in that much of a position to do much about any of these things. In order to sort of to keep these countries in line, some kind of demonst- some kind of nuclear demonstration may not be out of the question. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen, but I think it's a factor that perhaps increases the probability more than Western governments are willing to admit to their populations. It's not something that we've seen at all in the uh, in the Western media. But remember, countries like Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, these were all parts of the Soviet Union. And these are all parts of the world that Russia still sees itself as having to control. And an easy way to do that is to is to really come up with a loud bang. And that would definitely do it. But as you say, that would probably even a demonstration would probably trigger a heightened response from the West. And by that, I don't mean just sanctions like what we've seen. Yeah, you no, know, I still I think I still think that it is it is unlikely that this would happen. But then again, Russia right now is in a hole. And they are in a situation where they recognize they're in a hole, but they can't stop digging. And they're still digging. And this would be, you know, just just to dig it even further. I don't think this is going to happen. I I don't think there's a high probability of it, but I think the probability is higher than we're admitting in the West. No, I, I think it's dangerous. I mean, I think it very could easily spin out of control. Yeah, you just really don't know what Putin and Russia are going to do because we didn't think they were he was going to invade Ukraine. You see what happens. I think we we are now at to, we're now at the point that we can't really ascribe this just to Putin. Putin is under a ton of pressure from from various sides and various factions inside of Russia. His main goal right now is probably not taking Kiev. It is probably maintaining his hold in the Kremlin. And it's this is not necessarily an existential fight for Russia, as they're putting it, but it is very quickly becoming an existential fight for Putin. So I actually... Recently, in the Western media, we've seen these articles that 
have come out saying what you're saying, that basically Putin is under threat from even more nationalistic ideals and individuals in Russia. Do you think that's what's happening right now? I think under threat is probably too strong a word right now. The way this is is actually breaking down is is weirdly reminiscent of the Soviet Union in the 1930s under Stalin when the great purges were taking place. And the excesses, the real crimes against humanity were more or less being controlled by Stalin. But all of the blame was going on the security services, which is why you had so much turnover in, you know, with with the various the various heads of the NKVD, you know, or the various organizations that eventually became the uh, the KGB. What's happening right now is everybody knows Putin is in charge of this, but all of the blame is going on to the Russian Ministry of Defense, and more and more people who are in the know, people who are following the military, the mill bloggers for instance, are placing the blame on the Russian Ministry of Defense, which incidentally is just where Putin needs it to go, because the blame is not falling on him, even though we're getting more and more evidence that he himself uh, is is micromanaging many of the events in this war, often catastrophically. To say that Putin himself is under threat is probably probably not accurate. I would definitely say that, that Shoigu, for instance, the Russian Minister of Defense, his days in that position are numbered, and it's it's been looking bad for a while. This uh, this ridiculously failed mobilization too. It's it's definitely going to come back to bite him. They have been recycling these generals, and well, cycling through these generals, many of them who themselves are are recycled, and they're just putting up uh, essentially patsies to take the fall as this as this operation just gets worse and worse. Let's move on to another event that's happened recently. Last month, actually, Russian-owned Nord Stream gas pipelines, which carry gas from Russia to several European countries. That's kind of been a sticking point with countries like Germany who don't want to place too harsh of sanctions on Russia because they get a lot of their energy from Russia. Other countries like Denmark get that gas as well. So those pipelines suffered undersea leaks that were caused by explosions on them last month. So both Russia and the West have accused each other of sabotaging the pipelines. Some in the West have accused the West, if you know what I'm talking about, some media sources that are out there. Judge Xander. But would you, I don't want you to speculate, but if it is true that Russia ended up causing the leaks, because we don't have a definitive answer, is this part of Putin's plan to try and break the West, as we knew he was trying to do earlier, is that part of his plan by causing oil and gas prices to rise, which we have seen, especially here in the United States, even if it's not directly the controlling party's fault in the White House and the Congress, they're going to get blamed for it? Well, to do that, he didn't, he didn't have, to, have to sabotage the pipeline. He could have just cut it off. You know, so that's essentially yes, but but that's not why we had these these explosions. I mean, what what happened was, I mean, it, it was sabotage. I think they've they've sort of definitively determined that as sabotage. Yeah, who is behind it? It does seem unclear. I mean, there's no real good reason for the West to have done this. Russia is prob- was probably in a better position to accomplish it, but. Again, it doesn't really seem to serve that much of an advantage to Russia unless you would consider it a false flag operation, which is more or less the Russian calling card. They've been trying to do this in Ukraine for the past several months, too. So, you know, if 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 you were to, you know, sort of point out the most likely culprit, it's it's pretty obvious. But again, really, it, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, I think it was more than anything else, it was probably a failed political operation. I mean, other than the disastrous effects of leaking all this methane into the sea. You. You know, I mean, it it really was just sort of like a failed political operation for Putin. At least that's what it looks like more and more right now. But yeah, the overall strategy of 
hitting the West economically, literally freezing out Western Europe for supplying Ukraine is is a well, it's almost the tip of the spear for the uh, for the Russian strategy against Western Europe. And as the army in Ukraine just continues to, you know, to fail and take losses, it's more and more becoming the main strategy for, uh, for uh, well, for their operations in Ukraine as well. Uh, over the past several days, more and more, you've seen these drone attacks hitting hitting civilian infrastructure, hitting power plants, with the goal of making it a very, very cold winter in Ukraine, essentially trying to freeze them into submission. It's a little bit ironic, actually, that, you know, they would be trying to, you know, to make it such a cold winter for Ukraine. The conscripts that they have been sending to Ukraine are ill-equipped. And many of them, you know, if they're lucky to, if they're lucky enough to have weapons, don't even have winter gear, which is really odd for a country like Russia. And winter's coming up too. Yeah. And it it's cold over there. Yeah. Well, the thing is, with the oil and gas and the energy, if you think it's bad here in the U.S., heating prices in, I know, at least Germany are going, it's going to be crazy this winter, what they're going to experience, mostly because of this. And you also have OPEC, Saudi mm-hmm. Arabia, all these countries that have the oil cutting barrels right now, which they did a month before the midterms, which was also really interesting. But that is also going to hurt Europe, too. So I've got to think that that is at least part of what Putin is trying to do. But don't you think that could also backfire and it could also lead to the West becoming more involved? Well, yeah, it certainly could. But you got to remember, the Russian narrative to all of this is that the West is just incredibly decadent you know, self-interested and that we will lose interest in Ukraine. We have no real compassion for the Ukrainians once we start to notice that we're not being well-fed and warm over Christmas. I mean, he he's expecting Western support mm-hmm. to just evaporate. All right. So at the beginning of the invasion, when Russia sent troops down from the northern border, that was from Belarus. Belarus is, of course, one of the few allies that Russia has in this, but those weren't troops from Belarus, those were Russian troops. Belarus has not sent troops to Ukraine, but Russia is increasing the pressure for them to do that. So do you think that that's a realistic possibility? And do you think that that's going to have any effect? Yeah, I think Lukash- L- well, Lukashenko politically cannot do this. He's, he's in a precarious enough position as it is. He, can't, he cannot send troops to Ukraine. It, it will effectively meet mean the end of his regime. And I think Putin probably knows that too. And Russia's military is in bad shape. The military of Belarus is in even worse shape. Yikes! I I don't really think it would have much of an effect. If there were to be another offensive from the north aimed at Kiev, I don't think that the counteroffensive would stop at the Belarusian border. And I think Belarus, I think Lukashenko probably knows that too. And he, you can't forget the other borders he has are with NATO countries. I, I, I really don't see this happening. I mean, I, unless Putin more or less literally puts a gun to his head and says, you've got to commit. But I, I actually don't really even see the Belarusian military following through with that. Could they use it as a staging ground? For you know, for another push, yeah, probably. I think they would go that far, but I really don't think you're going to see Belarusian tro- troops in in Ukraine, especially not the way the war is going right now. Mm-hmm. All right, so moving into Russia right now, Putin announced last month that Russia would call up around three hundred thousand reservists, which are basically male citizens who were just living in Russia. That led to what looked like from here widespread backlash across Russia from their citizens. We saw land borders with mile backups of cars trying to get out of the country after that happened. But, of course, we don't really have much intel publicly inside Russia right now that what we know. So would you say that it appears that support for the war inside Russia is falling with all the other stuff, but especially with that call up. First of all, with the, with the reservists, 
this was supposed to be people with prior military experience. That illusion dropped away within the first few seconds of the of the call up and it quickly became it became obvious that this call up was for anybody with a penis and opposable digits as long as they could hold a firearm they were essentially fair game and the stories that have been coming out of russia you know people literally being grabbed off the street literally being grabbed off the street of quote unquote recruiters waiting at the in the entrance halls of apartment buildings for men any men to come out i mean these these things have have spread like wildfire across russian society does it mean that support for the war is dwindling it's 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 actually a little bit different to tell because it's not necessarily that there was that much support there to begin with. It's just once it really started to to affect people in the capitals, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and in, you know, really the central Russian cities, once it starts to affect them, the sort of veil drops away as to what is happening. Russia has probably lost about 20,000 people. And I, I'm not. I'm just talking about killed. I'm not talking about all the casualties. But it probably is around twenty thousand. You can't have numbers like that, even if they're confined more or less to ethnic minorities on the outskirts of you know of the country. You can't keep this quiet. People do not want to go and fight in this war. That is, you know, that is brutally obvious. And most of them probably thought that they wouldn't have to. So they got this kind of tacit acquiescence. I wouldn't necessarily say it was it was support going on. So has has support dropped? Well, yeah, probably. But really, I think more of more and more of what we're seeing is kind of like the veil dropping away to sort of expose more or less the real attitudes, many of which have kind of been there from the very beginning. Now, the mass exodus that you see, it, it's, it really kind of repeats what happened earlier in the war, when a lot of the Russian sort of intellectual class fled the country. We're getting this again. And now it's sort of the, uh, the Russian masculine class that seems to be, you know, trying to get out. Yeah. It's a mess. I mean, the thing has been an absolute disaster really from the very beginning. And every day you get you get new stories of just <laughs> just horrible things happening as a result of this. I mean, it was it was two days ago that you had a mass shooting at a uh, at a Russian training facility, which, you know, I mean, the details on this are still murky. But given the way the Russian supplies have been going, it's amazing that these people got their hands on a weapon and could use it so effectively. And I'm not just trying to be, you know, to be glib here. One of the reasons that this, this conscription is not working is that th they can't supply all of these people. Not only that, but they have nobody to train these people. The uh, Most of the, um, you know, the trainers that they had for the Russian military are in Ukraine. And if they're not in Ukraine, it means they're dead. It's 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 an absolute mess. It's kind of it's it's really not surprising that you've heard people like Medvedev, for instance, you know, mention nuclear weapons more and more because it seems like that's really the only the only other option they've got. You know, I said before that the strategy now sort of seems to be they're throwing bodies at the problem. And with this with this last call up that seems to be more or less what they're doing so i think the better question is does this mean that the people in russia are engaging more because as you said the support may have already been low but they're you know just not going to do anything about it does this engage more russian people against putin and the government or are all those people leaving yeah i mean i think a lot of the people who were really a threat to the powers that be in the Kremlin left in the uh, in the initial phases of the war, more and more of them seem to be seem to be leaving now too. I you know it 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 kind of sounds bad, but I mean I think Putin's position, at least for the moment, still seems to be kind of secure. This could change in a heartbeat, but literally, you know, from, you know from 
from this vantage point right now, you know, he still seems to be more or less unquestioned. He's done a very good job of deflect, deflecting blame. And people do seem to be to be buying into it pretty well. All right, Dr. Bobby. So last question I got for you, and hopefully this helps everyone, because as I said, we haven't gotten as much coverage of the Ukrainian war, the invasion, what's going on here in Western media. We're still getting a bunch, and you can still get information. So what have been the sources that you have gone to for information on the war? Well, you know, I, I actually don't think the American media has done a terrible job on this. You know, I think the New York, sorry to bring up these these newspapers, um, the New York Times, the Washington Post has, you know, Fake news. obviously they're, 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 they get distracted, but, you know, they've done a pretty good job of, of reporting it. A lot of very, very important events, however, if if they're not, you know, like one of these spectacular bridge explosions or something like that, they're they're usually a couple days behind. BBC has been a really good resource. If if you can read Russian, the BBC Russian service, BBC Ruskaya Slushba, is is magnificent. They have they have extensive updates every single day. Just just for a moment, actually, if 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 we are talking about um about Russian Russian news services, uh Dost TV Rain is back on the air and it is covering this. Now they are they are necessarily limited, but it v- does give a very good Russian Russian perspective on this, as does Medusa. You can find podcasts. You can find this online too. Mm-hmm. Again, it's in Russian, so it does. It is for a uh, a rather limited audience. Those uh, captions. Well, yeah, I'm not sure how much I. Uh. <laughs> There's also a Ukrainian Russian service which you can get on uh, on YouTube UA, which Ukraine is necessarily being secretive about a lot of their operations particularly the operations around Kherson in the in the south. So you do get a lot of up to up to the minute reporting especially when it comes to Russian attacks and things like that. They are still observing sort of an operational silence around the Ukrainian counteroffensive at least in the south. In the east in Donetsk and Lugansk they they are a little bit more open. It's going to sound really weird, but probably the most reliable source for Russian information can be found on the Telegram channels of the Russian military bloggers. In most of the cases, these are hard right-wing, ultranationalist Russian commentators who are 110% behind the war. And if they criticize Putin at all, and on occasion it does come out, it it's for not being strong enough against Ukraine. But they have a tendency, well, not all of them, but some of them have a tendency to be extremely honest about how the war is going. In fact, I think a lot of uh, a lot of Western sources, well, a lot of the more astute Western sources at least, have been looking pretty carefully. At what the uh, at what the Russian mill bloggers have had to say, because a lot of their predictions, uh, especially regarding the Ukrainian counteroffenses in the east, have proved to be very very accurate and backed up by by what we what we learn usually a few days later of um, of how the uh, of how the Russian army was operating in these areas. Going to the uh, the English language sources, you know, in addition to the ones I men- I mentioned, like I said, BBC is pretty good. The Guardian too has been giving daily updates. Actually, the um, the the Russian <laughs> the British Ministry of Defense. You know, I never read Twitter, but their Twitter page is always worth checking out. You know, it is usually very accurate and very current. Also, DW.com. Um, this is this is a German service. They you know they have both you know internet pages and uh, and a YouTube channel, which in a lot of times it's even more extensive than the BBC is. It it really is a good source for information. In the United States, just for how 
how the war is being conducted. Now, it mostly necessarily excludes a lot of the um, the political considerations, not always, but most of the time it does, is um, the Institute for the Study of War. They have an almost daily updated report on exactly what is going on. Incidentally, this is one of the services that that has at certain times, you know, studied the the Russian mill bloggers very, very carefully. And it's probably, if you're looking at it, you know, just for, you know, a kind of, I guess, strategic point of view, it's probably the most valuable resource we have in English, at least as far as the ones I've found. That's a lot of facts. All right, Dr. Bobby. Well, good information. Thank you for updating us on what's going on in Ukraine. As I said, it is very important. Stuff could change in a heartbeat. Thank you for joining us and updating us. Thanks a lot, Xander. Always glad to be here. Xander's Facts. So there you have it. Thanks once again to Dr. Bobby for coming on the podcast. And that is a wrap on episode 79 of the Xander's Facts podcast, our trip around the globe. Hopefully you learned a lot of facts about what's going on in Brazil and in Ukraine. But that is episode 79. Thank you all for listening to this edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. And remember, if you liked all the facts on this podcast, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 79, rate and review the podcast, then go on all your socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Xander's Facts is on there too, at Xander's Facts, that's Xander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, spread the facts! Xander's Facts podcast, tell all your friends about the podcast, about Xander's Weekend Facts, about the Xander's Facts YouTube channel, all the facts. And they are on the Xander's Facts link tree, which is linked to this episode's description. Check out all the Xander's Facts, which, if you want to learn more facts, might want to listen to next week's podcast. Be there or be square. Episode 80 is coming up next week on the podcast. And we, actually, I'm very excited. I'm recording this Tuesday night. And Tuesday night was opening night of the NBA regular season, which I am very excited about, especially after last week's podcast when we had our Xander's Facts NBA analyst Hillbilly on to preview the NBA season, make our picks for the playoffs and the finals. If you haven't listened to that, go check that out. Last week, episode 78. But next week, we are doing our season preview for college basketball. And the preseason AP poll came out on Monday. And the reigning ACC champions got one vote in the entire poll. Disrespectful! I'm going to talk about that next week. So we'll, we'll get in on to all that. Because I got some words to say to the AP poll voters. Please give me a break. I'll talk about that next week on episode 80 of the podcast. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 79 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all for listening. And we'll see y'all with episode 80 next week. Cool facts, bro.